welcome. Uh, this is other funding sources from lines of credit to loans and how to stay out of financial trouble. Uh, my name is Tracy Bissett and I'm really excited to be here with you today uh, as president and chief financial fitness trainer of Bissett Financial Fitness. It's really my privilege to be able to educate and empower young people like you and any parents who might be listening uh, to really take control of and live your, your financial lives with confidence. Uh, so I wanted to show you uh, me and I'm going to share my screen now and we're going to get right into it because I'm sure there's going to be a lot of questions as well. Um, so want to make sure that we have time for that. Um, so please drop them in the chat. Logan's going to help me out. Uh, so thank you very much, Logan. Um, want to start with uh, this little picture. Some of you may recognize it. Uh, this is a picture of a monopoly board. And sometimes it's hard to know what the financial future is going to hold for us. And so I like to think about financial literacy really as financial fitness. We're on this journey where we're going to increase our our financial acumen over time. We don't need to know everything at once, um, but we do need to get started. And just like physical fitness, we might be taking that first walk uh, around the block. We might be just starting to learn about different bank accounts. Today might be the first time that you're learning about all these different financial uh, sources of funds that you can use to pay for education, or we might be a little bit more sophisticated. We might be training for physical marathons or be actually going in to do some, some more sophisticated investing, something like that. So wherever you are in your financial fitness journey is right where you're supposed to be. Um, so I wanna make sure we set off by talking about that. And by no means am I perfect at handling my money. Uh, the reason I'm showing this uh, Monopoly board is when I was a kid, I used to play every single day. Uh, after school with my friend Jennifer and we would play for months at a time we'd keep the same game going and so I learned very quickly uh, when I was probably six seven years of age that money was a tool that you could use uh, to help you get where you were going and that was really important to me um, it just kind of came to be in my household we talked a lot about money uh, we, we weren't the, the best off in our neighborhood. We weren't the worst off. Um, I knew that we had money for all the things that we needed to do. Um, but I did spend a lot of time in my youth really doing part-time jobs, babysitting, had a few little entrepreneurial ventures for those that know junior achievement, certainly spent a lot of time working with that as well. And so you may be facing some uncertainty. You may be feeling overwhelmed. We're at the later part of the day today. Uh, so you've probably consumed a lot of information if you've been here with us since we kicked off at 12 o'clock and that's okay. So you're gonna be able to check out the recordings and make sure that you um, can take everything all in, which is fantastic. And today, what we're really going to talk about is I'm gonna let you know a little bit more about me. Then we're gonna dive into how this all starts with you which is really important. So we're gonna get into your money mindset, your goals, the importance of communicating. And we're also gonna talk about non-government um, borrowed sources of funds. So what's out there? What would kind of information would you need to provide to be able to be eligible and, and apply for these kinds of things? We're gonna talk about financial keys to success as well as pitfalls I want you to avoid because that's really important as well. So a little bit about me. Um, TD is the presenting sponsor today. I worked with TD for 16 years as an executive in their commercial lending and risk management groups. So certainly know lots about financial services. Um, when I left the bank, I started Visit Financial Fitness to really work with, educate and empower young adults. And I also work with entrepreneurs, as I mentioned. Uh, some of you were asking earlier about the presenters and where they went to school. So I have a bachelor's of commerce from Queens University. I have a master's in business from Dalhousie uh, University in Halifax, and I am also a CFA charter holder. So I really think an education is extremely important, uh, very valuable to me, certainly has helped me move through all of the things that I've wanted to do so far. Um, even to show you how important continuing education is, I am just wrapping up this semester my own uh, teaching diploma because I am a professor at Centennial College. And so I've been studying alongside my students, taking courses about how to become a teacher. Uh, so just so you know, the journey always continues and there's always more that we can learn. I was an entrepreneur in my youth, which was really fun. And I am the host and executive producer of the Young Money Podcast. So head over to my booth. You can certainly check out the links there to go and listen to the show. It is the advice show for millionaires in the making. It is uh, absolutely fantastic. You'll see some, some pictures on the screen. So Suzanne Tyson, a lot of you have heard from today. Um, Shelly Clayton, I know was referenced earlier today. 
the show is really around showcasing all the paths to wealth. So I hope that you will um, check it out. It's absolutely free. There's a new show every week. We've had Chris Wilkins on before talking about scholarships, Janet McDonald talking about how do we get um, through that process and do really good applications for scholarship, as well as tons of stuff on career. Uh, so really good resources for you. And then finally, this is me and my dog, Rosie. Um, we volunteer through Therapeutic Cause of Canada. And so just like you've heard today, volunteer work is important to me. And uh, all of you may be thinking about how you might get involved if you're not involved already. And so I volunteer um, over the years I have done with Big Sisters, Junior Achievement, United Way, and, and certainly um, during non-COVID times, Therapeutic Pause of Canada, uh, which is really fun. So you might be feeling stressed, as I mentioned, you might be feeling overwhelmed by this, this time in the day. I know Suzanne had some stats earlier about the level of debt that you will have potentially when you come out of post-secondary school. So on average, upwards of 25,000, 3,000 of that is in credit card debt. And that's really important. And I want to flag that for you because we're going to talk about credit cards today. And so if you're not sure what that is, even drop it in the chat for us. We're going to cover it, but I want to make sure we don't lose sight of it. The other thing that's really important is I'm going to pop to my booth after this presentation. So if you don't get your questions answered, I'm going to head over there uh, right after. I'll be there between uh, five and six so that you can come and get your questions answered. Um, what happens when we have so much student debt and some of it credit card debt, some of it potentially government loans or other types of loans? Is that when we have so much debt and we're trying to pay that off, it might delay other milestones in our life. We may not be able to travel. We may not be able to go back for that additional degree that we wanted. We may not be able to um, get a car or a home or whatever the things that are important to us uh, are. And so I wanna make sure that we're, we're thinking about money and we're thinking about it from a financially fit standpoint. And so you're really in the right place today to learn about other ways to get money, but then also how are we gonna manage it and make sure we're using it well. So rest assured you are in the right place. So we certainly wanna think about three things when we're getting started. And so the first thing is uh, that it all starts with you. So I want you to, to take this in. If you're gonna jot down a couple of things, these are a really good few points to start. You can see over on the, the one side, we've got a picture of a heart. And that's really to represent your money mindset. So when you think about money, do you feel like, and I'm gonna show you this slide, um, if I told you that you could make a million dollars in your lifetime, um, would you be thinking, yes, of course I can, I'm capable, over time I can do that, or no, that will never happen to me. If I, I point your direction um, to this picture of the palm trees and the beautiful beach, and I and ask you to imagine you being on this trip, are you thinking, yes, that can happen, or no, I'm, I'm never going to be able to afford that. And the way that you're instantly thinking of those things is all about your money mindset. And so um, most people have a scarcity mindset. So there's never going to be enough, there's never going to be enough money. I'm not going to be good enough. Somebody's always going to have more than me. And that is what the majority of the population has. And so I just want you to recognize that. I want you to think about it um, because you can certainly change your money mindset. Um, moving to a place of less scarcity, more over to abundance. So thinking about it in the, the framework of what we talked about today through the earlier sessions, when I apply for scholarships, I have as equal a chance as everybody else. You're not holding yourself back from applying and saying, like we heard from Jane Thompson earlier, um, oh, I'm not gonna apply, I'm not gonna be a good candidate. Don't rule yourself out. You're gonna take those opportunities. Will you get all of them? Perhaps not, but it, you can't win any of them if you don't try. So I want you to think about that a couple of things that I know to be true about mindset is that you can absolutely change your money mindset. So a couple of ways that you can do it, you can practice gratitude. I woke up today, I had food to eat, I had clothes to wear, all of that kind of good stuff. Spend time with people who have a positive outlook, a positive attitude, who bring you up is really important and create space for you to do things that you like. So if you're not liking the way you think about things, especially from a money standpoint, that can be changed and that's important to know. So that's the first thing. Number two, um, we've got the calculator here. We've got some sticky notes, some, some dollars and cents there. We wanna be thinking about our goals. When we go to school, and Chris Wilkins talked about this, when we're going to school, what is it that we're learning about? Why do we wanna learn this? What are we gonna do with this when we're done? And thinking through what's important to you. 
It doesn't matter what's important to your family, to your friends. Uh, it's important that you enjoy what you're going to go do and study and make sure that you're doing it for the right reasons. Um, because it comes with such uh, financial cost and expense when we're going to school, you want to make sure that you have really aligned with that. And uh, from there, the third piece is communication. So we've got a picture of a family here on the screen. And it's really important, uh, and today is a great catalyst to bring up that conversation and start talking to your family if you haven't talked to them already. Um, how much money do we have for school? Were you saving up some for me, family? Or, or are you finding out that no, there hasn't been an, an opportunity to save? And it's not about blaming our parents, blaming our family. It's about understanding how much are we starting with? How much money do we need to come up with to fill the gaps? And we're gonna talk about budgeting today, which is really important. And it's really tempting as a young adult to think that um, your parents are just gonna take care of you or your family's just going to take care of you. Um, but I think that certainly through the pandemic, we've seen everybody's financial position has been different. We wanna make sure that we're setting time to communicate with our parents about what, what it is we would like to understand the lay of the land, the facts, and then be able to move forward with a plan. So a couple of things that you can do when you're, you're brainstorming is you wanna think through your request fully if you are asking your, your family to contribute. So what, how much is it going to cost? And I'm gonna help you today be able to quantify that. We also wanna have a time where we talk about it. We just don't throw it out uh, one day when everybody's kind of in a rush, we set time and we actually get together and come and communicate properly. And then when we, we've had a chance to each explore our, our positions and what it is that we can do and what we would like, come up with a mutually agreeable solution. And so all of these things are super important before you start, um, before you're starting to take on debt. Uh, really important to think about your money mindset, your goals, and then certainly communication with your family. Now I wanna dig in and I wanna get into these non-government um, sources of borrowed funds. And so we heard earlier from TD that they um, have a special part on their website dedicated to students. And certainly we, um, we know that other financial institutions have this as well. So some of the things that are available and I'm gonna first go through the list and then I'm going to explain them uh, and, and talk about what they are. So we might have student lines of credit, personal loans, overdraft protection, student credit cards, and then car loans. And then so for any parents who might be tuning in and you might have younger children, you might be thinking about starting a registered education savings plan. And that's certainly in Canada. Um, I have got here, I'm just gonna, I'll drop some links in the chat later. If you head over to my booth, you'll be able to download the top 25 resources to help you pay for school. The link to the uh, RESP or the Registered Education Savings Plan um, government site is there, and that will help you get information about that. So a line of credit is something that you can apply for. The way that it works is you will typically transfer money into your bank account as you need it. And if you have a student line of credit, during the time that you were in school and up to a certain amount of time later, and it usually is gonna depend on the financial institution, you'll pay um, potentially interest only. You won't be making any principal payments until perhaps one year, two years after school is over. And so it's up to you to manage and live within that limit. Typically for undergraduate programs, the limit could go up to something like a 20,000 a year per year of study. If you're in a, um, Post, uh, postgraduate, you're in a PhD program, the limits do go a little bit higher, as well as if you're in a very specialized program. And TD showed us earlier when, in the presentation when they kicked it off where to see all of those amounts. And so the amounts different are different um, depending on what you're studying. But undergraduate, typically up to 20,000 a year. And I think that from all the sessions you've heard today, and if this is the first one that you're joining from, um, if you're going away to school, 20,000 may not do it and you may not um, actually receive that much on a, on a line of credit. So you wanna be looking at all of the sources you can bring together to make sure that you have enough money. A personal loan would be um, something a little bit different, not necessarily student driven, um, but you're going to be able to get a larger amount of money. Um, the key with credit, and that's what all of these things are, credit, what they're doing is they're looking at your credit reputation. And so for most of you, um, given your age, you're not going to yet have a, a reputation from a credit standpoint or a credit score is another way to talk about that. And so in most of these cases, you're gonna need somebody to sign with you, whether it's a parent, a guardian, 
someone else who says that, and when they sign in writing, they are saying, if Tracy can't pay the money, I'm going to pay it. And it's not an option for them. When somebody co-signs with you, um, they're, they're putting themselves on the hook. And so when they're doing that, the, the institution, so for instance, TD, but all of them are going to do the same thing. They're going to see, can the two of them pay back this money if need be? And so it factors in what's the credit score of your parents, if it's your parents or whoever else is co-signing, and do they have enough funds uh, and is their credit history and their credit score strong enough to be able to pay back this money? So a personal loan, they would give you the money, you would pay it back over time. Overdraft protection, it's linked to your bank account. And so if you happen to um, say you're at uh, McDonald's, you're buying something and you had $5 in your account, uh, but your meal costs you $11.50, it's going to take um, the $6.50 out of the overdraft. And so overdraft comes usually at a higher rate um, that you're going to pay than a line of credit or even a personal loan. Now, credit cards have a time and a place. I think that, in my opinion, credit cards are not good or bad. It's all in how you use them. Um, but certainly, you do need to be responsible in their use. Um, you want to make sure that um, you're, you're using them for things that you can pay for. It's not meant to be an extension or a replacement for cash. And so when you're thinking about credit cards, it's not one of the sources of funding for school. It's just maybe how you're making that payment. A lot of times now, I, I mentioned earlier that I'm a professor at Centennial College. A lot of times to secure your ebook, you need to make that purchase online. So you need a credit card to do that. But the credit card is not the ultimate way that you're paying for the textbook you need to have then funds to pay off the credit card. So that's important. And then some of you may be commuting as opposed to going uh, away to school, or you may have a car as well. A car loan is another source of funding that may, may assist. So I'm gonna pause there just because I've talked about a lot of things and I'm gonna get uh, Logan to tell me if there's any questions so far on things we've covered. Sure are. Uh, quite a few questions have come in. Uh, they're all sort of specific though, so I'll just offer them in the order that they've come uh, and we'll, we'll do the best okay. uh, that we can. Um, so this is from a student. I'm going to uni abroad and we'll have to pay over 150000 in tuition alone. I have no idea what I'm going to do financially with a sum like this. How do I possibly budget? Uh, so first of all, if you already know that it's going to be 150,000 plus, you're going to same, same way as anybody else who's listening would make a budget. What's tuition? What are the, all the other costs related to school? Now think about, obviously you're not going to be living at home if you're going abroad. What's the cost for, for where you have to live for your food, all of those kinds of things. You're going to add in stuff like flights, which even students who may be going to school in Canada, but living in a different place from where their, their home province is they're going to have those expenses as well. So firstly, you need to come up with a list of the total that you think it's going to cost. And then you're trying to find all of those sources to pay for it. And um, we'll get into a couple options a little bit later around how do we deal with when maybe there's a difference. So we've got the amount we know it's going to cost and then we are, we're coming up short. So we'll talk about that. Uh, beauty. Okay, thanks. Um, one from an international student. Can international students uh, over 18, borrow money from the Canadian bank, and if so, is there, to what extent? Um, so every institution is going to be different. A lot of times they will have um, Newcomer to Canada programs, um, and so you're going to want to check out in each institution. I know when I was checking out TD's site earlier today, they had a specific thing for international students. Um, so sometimes, because they you wouldn't have established a credit history in Canada, they're going to have perhaps lower um, thresholds for amounts, uh, but every institution is going to be specific. So you want to check out their um, very particular websites. And so if you um, head over to TD, RBC, BMO, whoever it's going to be, look up student um, loans, international students, they should have some commentary there for you. Uh, as I said, when I looked at TDs, it was very nicely laid out. They had a whole bunch of categories for different programs, and then they had a category for international students. And these are credit decisions. So these aren't um, grants of money, these are monies that have to be paid back. And so when they're looking at considering giving this money out, it's on the basis of do we think we're going to be repaid? 
Uh, financial institutions in Canada are not charitable organizations. They have a mandate to their shareholders to make money. And so they need to make sure that there's appropriate risk and return involved. And so they are more generous in their offerings to students, but they still don't uh, give out money without the expectation of it getting repaid. So that's really important to understand. And maybe we'll take one more, Logan, and then we'll, we'll keep going. Okay, sure. Yeah, we've got several certainly that are, are piling up, but we'll be able to address them as we go. Uh, the next one that we have is kind of specific. How trustworthy is a company, Empower Financing? Uh, the student found it online. They offer pretty high loans for international students who study in Canada. Are you familiar at all? I, I'm not familiar with that one. Um, and I'm also in this forum, I wouldn't provide any um, evaluations of companies. So that that brings though a great point that we can all learn from is that we need to always be asking questions. We need to do our due diligence. So if you've come across something like that in the course of your assessment, um, then you want to start digging into, do they have testimonials? Um, oftentimes when someone has a greater credit risk, the cost is more expensive. And so, as I was saying, newcomers to Canada, they don't have a credit history yet in Canada. And so I can see why somebody might charge more, uh, but then it's investigating, um, do they have any complaints against them? Are there any lawsuits? Uh, if you can't find any information either, that's probably not a good sign. So doing your due diligence is really important. And um, always a great way to check things out, as I know Suzanne mentioned earlier, is why not talk to the financial assistance department at the school that you're considering going to or that you are accepted into. Okay, bad. Thanks. Uh, yeah, we've got several more questions uh, and more coming in, I'm sure, but we'll uh, take another break and, and do some more whenever you're ready. Great. So all of these things, um, if you haven't kind of processed what they are, um, we'll keep going. Uh, and certainly you can, can do a search, you'll find out the information. But the key, as I said, is that they're making a credit decision when they loan you the money, which is really important to understand. And so in terms of the kinds of information that you're going to need to submit um, for them to assess if they, they want to loan the money, um, they're going to need your address. So if you haven't lived there very long, they're going to be looking for a couple of addresses they're going to be looking for a budget, which is very, very important. So um, we wanna be thinking about that and we'll, we'll dig into that a little bit. Suzanne touched on it earlier and she provided that really great worksheet from higher ed points, but they wanna know all of the money you have coming in. So anything between jobs from your family, anything like that, they wanna know if you have a rent payment. So anything that you've got fixed, you've gotta do any other monthly payments. Um, so if you have an existing credit card, if you have an existing loan, what is that obligation that you have to pay? They also want to know all of your household costs. So for your cell phone, for your um, insurance, any utilities, they're looking for this complete financial picture so they can see if when they loan this additional money, are you going to have funds to be able to pay it back? And as I said, with something very specific like a line of credit, they're not expecting you to be paying it back while you're in school. There is a, a period after which you're going to start principal repayments and they're counting on the fact that you will be able to find a job in what you studied for so that you can start repaying the loan. Something like a credit card though, as soon as you take out that credit card and you're using it, you do need to make monthly payments. So if we're thinking of line of credit, we pay back later, credit card, we have to pay it the same month or next month, uh, really uh, when we're incurring those, those expenses. They're gonna be looking like for proof of enrollment. They're not going to loan you money to go to school if they don't know where you're going to school and what that's gonna look like. They'll be looking for identification. So you'll have to confirm, um, especially we have so many international students um, watching today and, and participating today, they're gonna to wanna to know um, are you a Canadian citizen? Do you have your PR? Are you visiting Canada to go to school? So then they can know which bucket and, and which lending guidelines they use when they're looking at things. And then, as I mentioned before, um, they're typically going to be looking for a co-signer. So for any undergraduate programs and they're giving student loans, even student credit cards, they're very much gonna be looking for a co-signer and reasonably so because up until that point, you probably haven't had a job where you earned enough income to be able to repay that student debt. When it comes to master's or PhD or, or second, third degree programs, uh, which still may be undergrad, but um, not the first program, 
there, that it will be dependent on your situation and uh, whether or not you need a co-signer. And so just for real certainty here, a co-signer when they sign with you means that they are responsible for the debt just like you. So if you don't make the payments, the financial institution goes to them. So really important to think about. And not everybody really considers that. And I'm gonna talk about it a, a little bit later too because I've seen some stuff uh, with students that, that really is concerning. So now let's talk about financial keys to success. I know even in my booth a little bit earlier, we had some questions around how do we manage all this stuff? So the first thing is we need to set a reasonable and realistic budget. I've seen lots of cases where people will set unrealistic budgets. And by unrealistic, I don't mean that it's so big and it covers everything. I mean that it's actually too small. It only really covers tuition, maybe some books, but doesn't really think about all those expenses outside of school. So maybe your transportation, uh, whether it's through um, like a bus or a subway or a car, it doesn't include money for, for laundry or meals or all of those other kinds of things that you might need, even your cell phone. And so that what ends up happening is that you, you start to get partway through the year and all of a sudden you're running out of money. And so that doesn't do anyone any good because now all of a sudden you're in school, you're supposed to be putting your attention first and foremost on your courses. And now all of a sudden you don't have enough money to finish. Your parents or your family might be starting to get upset. Um, and, and it all stems from not having a reasonable and realistic budget. So as I mentioned, Suzanne provided that great tool. TD talked about, um, they have the budget calculator as well. There are people who've gone through this so many times ahead of you, learn from the experience, make sure you're thinking through every single thing. If you're living away from home, you're gonna have a whole extra list of expenses versus somebody who's living at home. And so important to make sure you get the right thing. Um, and again, having that communication and that dialogue with your family. So you can talk about, here's what the budget is really expected to be. How are we going to, to make sure we can cover that? And talking to them in a, a planned, coordinated way around, do you have any funds that can support me? Great, okay, if so, we know this is the total, here's how much you can contribute, what do we have left and how are we going to do that? And how are we all going to make this work? Uh, it's not the, not the responsibility just of our families to make this work. We all need to be a participant in this. Number two is incur, and so take on as little debt as you can and actively make a plan to pay it back when you graduate. Um, so if we can work part-time without jeopardizing our studies um, that can bring in some money, maybe we still have the loan uh, and we have the money on the side, but then we can pay it back right away if we're not using it. Um, if we can get scholarships, if we can get grants or we can get bursaries, all of that reduces our need to take on as much debt, which means we don't have to pay it back when we're done school. And that is really important, um, which brings me to the third point is think about your future financial goals. When we carry a lot of student debt, sometimes that can then delay the next things that we want to do in life. A lot of you are coming in, you're thinking about high school, you might not be thinking about okay, I want to travel when I'm done. I want to go on and um, want to get a car. I maybe want to get my first home. I want to go on to do a master's. Um, how much debt you have impacts when you can do those things. And so you want to be thinking about how much money might you be making out of the program that you're going to study? What types of jobs might I get? How much money will I make from that realistically? And so will I be able to pay that back or is that going to be hard for me to do that? So thinking about all of those things, and I know it can feel overwhelming. Um, so best place to start is to just start making notes. What are the salaries that are typically coming out of people from the program I want to study in? If I've made my budget and I've captured all the things, how much debt am I going to need to make that work? Okay, so thinking through all of that. Next, and certainly not uh, least at all, is to build and protect a strong credit reputation. So just like you would have a reputation um, already, people will know you for certain things. We're talking about your credit or your financial reputation. So if you've already had potentially a credit card and you haven't paid it back, maybe you missed some payments, maybe your credit score is already impacted, that's going to impact your ability to borrow more money. Also, if you're just borrowing for the first time, you want to make sure you understand the terms and conditions and how you're supposed to operate with these different loans. Uh, like I said, with the line of credit, they're not expecting you to pay back the principal during the time, 
but if you have a credit card, you are expected to make payments. And so you want to be thinking about that and protecting your credit reputation at all costs. Um, because what happens is when you are finished school and you go to get a job, they're going to do a credit check. They're going to see if there's any issues. You may be moving to a different location. You might need to rent an apartment. A landlord is going to look at your credit score and see what that tells them, especially if they have a building where a lot of people want to live in it. They're not going to choose a tenant who has a poor credit score when they can choose one that doesn't. And a credit score would give them an indication of how likely are you going to be repaying your money. While you're in school, get a student banking account so that you can pay lower fees and you can manage those costs. That's one cost that actually doesn't show up in a lot of uh, students' budget, those, those banking fees. And if you're taking money out all of the time, you're going to have lots of uh, transaction costs. And so you want to reduce those. Number six, and this ties into the question that was asked about if I'm going to go and the tuition is uh, over 150000 and it's going to cost much more than that, or about that um, particular company loaning uh, funds to international students at a higher rate, we want to make sure we're asking lots of questions. We want to do our due diligence. We want to make sure that something makes sense. And if you don't feel comfortable, if you don't know the answers, you keep asking questions till you do. And if you can't get the right answers, it's probably not something you want to participate in or you want to be involved with. So the onus is on you to, to take responsibility, to dig until you find out the answers and you don't have to do it alone. There's been so many great resources we've talked about today. And then finally, you want to certainly communicate communicate with your family, communicate with the school once you get, get signed up. And if you are having trouble, whether it's number one, figuring out how to do a budget, um, even figuring out how to apply for scholarships, where you might do it, how you might do it, asking for help. And certainly when you're in school, and so many of you are already in school, if you're having challenges, especially from a financial standpoint, you want to ask for help. The financial assistance department of any school is there to help you. Um, if you're having trouble, you can't um, get access to food. They've got emergency food banks. They often have um, used clothing centers where you can get clothes uh, absolutely free to wear to job interviews. So don't underestimate the amount of help that's out there. All you need to do is ask, which is really, really important. Okay. Now, a couple of things I want to call out just for um, people who might want a little bit more guidance on setting a budget. So we talked about grants, scholarships, bursaries. Um, can we get awards from high school? I know that were mentioned in other um, sessions. Can you get gifts for your birthday? Could people give you money for a special occasion? Could you get money to go towards school versus something else? Um, we've talked about higher ed points, getting someone to use their loyalty points to help you pay. Uh, I had a part-time job all the way through high school. I was so proud. I saved up $7,000 by the time my first year university came. Um, and that only paid half of it, not even half of it, um, because I went away to school. I needed a computer, all kinds of different things. Um, but working part-time, if that allow, if your um, the way that you study and your coping allows you to do that, it's a great way to then uh, limit how much debt you're taking on. Use your credit cards for emergencies only. Maybe you're going to go to school part time. If in the case of that really expensive tuition, if you can't find enough sources to make that work, it's probably a pause and thinking about, is this the right decision? How could I do it a different way? So maybe it's going part time. Maybe it's living at home. Do you have registered um, education savings plans? Did your family start that for you? If you're a little bit more mature student, do you have um, registered retirement savings plans where you can take money out of your RRSP and use it towards going to school? Uh, if you're already working or even your family's working, see if their employer has um, programs to allow money to be awarded to um, children uh, for school. So that's another one sometimes overlooked and an important thing to look at. Look at government loans as we've, we've seen today See if you can qualify for scholarships, not only on the front end, but each year you're in school as well as on the back end. Um, I know I saw Ricardo um, was on here earlier and he was talking about getting scholarships. That can be done on the back end when you're done school. So you can actually pay down debt um, before you even start that formal repayment period. Um, and then, as I said, think about your future goals. 
All right, I'm going to do one more slide and then we're going to jump into more questions because I know I'm covering a lot of information. So financial pitfalls to avoid, which is absolutely critical. We want to be thinking about this. So number one, spending more than you earn. That is one that typically happens. Uh, we're very much influenced by social media in society these days and we have this instant gratification. We absolutely want things right away. So being very, very mindful of that. If you budgeted uh, for a certain amount for food, Uber Eats every night is not going to help you stay within that budget. So what goes along with budgeting is then actually tracking, are we staying within our means um, and the amount that we allocated? And um, earlier TD talked about their TD Spends app, which can help us monitor our spending. I have seen students unfortunately take out payday loans. They may have a part-time job. And so what a payday loan is, is giving you advance on your paycheck. And payday loans have a very, very high rate of interest. And once you get in the cycle of having them, it's very, very difficult to get out. Um, so at all costs, you want to stay away from payday loans. Credit cards, as I said, um, they allow you to buy things, especially in, an, in a time where we have to buy things online. It's important to have access to a credit card, but you are going to know your own behavior. Are you good at being disciplined? Are you good at having some self-control and only using it when you need? And so really either only an emergency or as I was talking about earlier with our e-techs that we might need for class, we probably need to buy them online, but then we want to pay our credit card off immediately. We don't just want to rack up our credit card on Uber or Uber Eats or, or other things that we feel will make us happy uh, if we don't have the money for that because it's not our money it's a credit tool and we want to make sure we use it properly unfortunately i have seen this um, several times with students in my own classes are students co-signing with each other for either a friend or a romantic partner for a car uh, for something else and then that friend or partner kind of disappears and um, that student that is talking to me is now left with that, that loan and that debt. Because co-signing means you are now responsible. And so a couple of things you can think about if somebody asks you to co-sign, because you obviously want to be supportive to your friend or your partner. Is the loan going to be outstanding for as much time as you've known this person? If you haven't known them as long as the car is going to be, the car loan is going to be there, maybe not the best idea. Could you afford to make the payments if that person stops making them is another really good question to ask yourself. And it doesn't mean you're not supporting them if you don't co-sign. You might help them make a budget. You might help them find a part-time job, maybe a cheaper car, maybe instead of new, it's used. And you can be supportive of them without um, potentially risking your financial fitness. Getting a car too soon is another big financial pitfall. It's sometimes nicer. <laughs> let's be honest, it's nicer to go in a car than maybe in a mass transit to go to school. But a car has a lot of costs and gas is usually just the minimum. Insurance is very expensive. You're gonna have the maintenance uh, and then all of the things that you've got to do with the car. Um, so go without as long as you can, as long as it's uh, feasible, um, because that's gonna dramatically uh, impact your budget. And then the other financial pitfall is absolutely doing nothing not making a budget, not monitoring your spending. You want to be absolutely on top of what you're doing, what you're using your funds for and making sure that you have enough uh, to take you through the year. So if you head over to our booth as well, I've got the top 25 resources to help you pay with school. So you can check that out and download it. Uh, as I mentioned, the Young Money podcast, we do a new show every single week. We've got episodes on all of the things that I've talked about today. So that will be very helpful for you. There's even a specific tab on our, our website that has the, the podcasts that are really delineated for students. Another financial pitfall I'd like to add, because we've seen it, um, especially during COVID as government supports were coming in, uh, we've seen an increase in day trading. We've seen students taking their, their government supports and using it, trying to make um, that big break uh, on something like GameStop, uh, AMC, people getting into cryptocurrency. So we want to use caution. We want to know what our goals are. We want to make sure that we're, we're protecting the funds that we need to get us through the, the school year. So I'm gonna open it to questions. Um, as a reminder, I'm gonna be at my booth um, between five and six after this, uh, cause I know many of you will have very specific questions. Um, so we'll get Logan to jump back into questions. And then if you don't get your question answered, please come over there and I'll be happy to answer them. 
Beauty, thanks, Tracy. Yeah, we've got about 15 minutes uh, before we need to break it off. But yeah, uh, hit up the booth if we don't get to your question. We've got quite a few uh, piled up here. Hey. Uh, okay, first one's pretty quick and simple. Can international students uh, apply for car loans as well? I believe so. And so it will obviously, again, be dependent on um, the place that you're getting them. So it's going to be dependent on the lender because every lender will have different rules. So you want to think about that. And I'm going to pop a couple links here in the chat for you. Sure, thanks. Um, are there disadvantages to getting government grants and do they affect uh, your taxes, your income tax? Uh, so taxes are not my area of expertise, um, but usually unless they tell you it's a taxable benefit um, that it will incur that. Um, it's really going to depend. There are different um, classifications of monies that they're, they're awarding. So you'd want to check that at the time you're accepting. They will give you, um, and that brings up a really good point. Whenever you are taking on a loan, you're receiving money from anyone, you want to make sure that you read all of those terms and conditions before you're accepting and you're signing to accept those monies, whether it be a loan, a grant, scholarship, anything like that, um, to make sure that you can be in compliance with that and you understand the implication. So if it is going to be a taxable impact that you know that at the time you're taking it on. Bad. Thanks very much. Uh, next question. Could a student, an international student's parents co-sign on a loan from their home country for a Canadian loan? I think it would be potentially uh, very challenging. I, I don't think that would necessarily meet those requirements. Um, but as I said, most of the financial institutions in Canada, they do have um, special programs for newcomers to Canada. So the, the amount that's loaned may not be as sizable uh, as would be um, loaned out to a, a Canadian citizen um, because of that, that kind of limitation and that lack of credit history here in this country. So I don't think co-signer is gonna work very well. Sure. Um, where can students apply for student lines of credit? Any major bank in Canada or credit union. So if we think about the big banks, we're thinking about TD, RBC, Bank of Montreal, CIBC, Scotiabank, National Bank, uh, credit unions um, in Ontario. Some of the larger ones are Meridian, Alterna, uh, Duca, um, out in BC, we'd looked at Coast Capital. So you want to, if you already are dealing with an institution, you want to start with the institution that you already bank with. It doesn't mean you don't explore other options, but why not start with the one you already have your banking with? Makes sense. Um, how much student debt is too much? Is there a threshold that you never want to cross? Uh, I, I don't think we can answer that with a never. Uh, it's uh, what I would encourage you to think about is based on what I'm studying, what is the, the job or the occupation I'm likely to come out with and how much money would I make in that? So if you knew you were coming out, um, and I don't mean necessarily like the first amount you're gonna make when you get in your first job, but over the course of your lifetime, um, say you were gonna do a program where over the course of your lifetime, you're, you're gonna make about 50,000 a year kind of indefinitely, would it make sense then to potentially take on a couple hundred thousand in debt? Probably not, okay? If, if we're thinking about where we maybe make 100,000 over our lifetime, um, then coming out with like a 30, 40,000 in debt, um, not the, the best situation, but certainly we could repay that. So it does actually come down to math. So you can pull out your calculator and talk, think through and do the math to see how many years would that take me to pay, pay that back. If I wanna pay it back sooner, what does that mean then uh, for the money I'm gonna have maybe to then rent, to buy a place, do all those other things that you have in your life. So if you know you have goals beyond this first school that you wanna accomplish, you wanna have that in mind as you're, you're thinking about how much debt you're gonna take on as a student in this particular program that you're looking at. Okay, cool, thanks. Um... This one I'm just going to read off. I'm not totally sure of the specifics. I have to borrow money from the province I am going to school in, correct? I'm not sure if this means student loans or, or line of credit or something. Uh, I'm not sure about that because um, it sounds like um, more not like a, from a bank program. Uh, it sounds more like um, questions coming at it from a, a provincial, uh, fed, um, provincial loan program like OSAP. Um, from the bank, you're, you will want to borrow from either the lo branch location by your school, or you could be doing it at, at the branch by where you live. So for instance, even when I was going to do my MBA, I lived in Ontario, but I was going to school in Halifax at Dalhousie. 
I remember I must have applied when I was still in Ontario, but I did go and make all the local arrangements at the branch uh, near Dalhousie. So um, I think it, it really depends if you're dealing with a national financial institution for a loan, it, it won't make a difference where you're, you're actually located because you're their customer across Canada. Okay, great, thanks. Um, is it possible to avoid debt entirely? And if so, uh, how? It is, yes, absolutely. Um, so you're gonna be creative. Um, number one, you're gonna make it pretty much a part-time job to be applying for scholarships, bursaries, uh, any free money that you can get your hands on. So that needs to be a very concentrated effort and it is doable. Uh, on one of the episodes, um, or two episodes of the podcast, we talked with um, a woman, Glenda Healy. She did this out of necessity for her two daughters. Between the two daughters, they were able to arrange um, and not through one big scholarship like the, the TD amount we heard earlier. This was over multiple scholarships um, between entrance and then scholarships throughout their schooling they were able to secure $60,000 between two students. So that's an awful lot of money. Um, is this possible? They're coming out with very little student debt. And so it's about how serious you wanna be. Uh, I'm sure Janet talked about it. If not, one of the stats she usually throws out uh, from my campus GPS is a thousand dollar scholarship is like 70 or 80 hours of work, depending how much you get paid by the hour. So think about that, do that math. Could you start working a little bit in high school? Um, could you be applying for the, the grants, the scholarships, things like that? Could you be working while you're going to post-secondary? What are other ways that you could raise money? And so be um, judicious, even in the summer jobs that you can take. Uh, I know I've recently been approved to hire for the summer from the Canada Student um, Jobs Program. Um, look for something that's going to advance your skills, but also maybe pays you more money. Um, I had waitressing jobs on top of office jobs um, in my summers between uh, years of university. So sometimes I had two jobs. I would work all day and then I would work a couple nights a week to make some more money. And that allowed me to come out of school with as little debt as possible. So it's about what can fit your lifestyle. Um, you want to make sure that the overriding factor is though that you do not jeopardize your ability to perform at school. That is your first priority. You want to make sure that you do well. That's why you're going to school. If you're falling asleep in class all the time, if you can't um, work on your assignments or, your, or study for your tests well, uh, if that's going to impair your ability to do that, you need to rein back on the, on the working. Um, but I think a lot can be gained from volunteering as well as working. Uh, and then just kind of hustle and make it a, a project to, to get all of those applications in to get some free money. And I'll, I will give a plug. My scholarship is open, the Young Money Scholarship Fund. So if you head over to the booth, you can find the link. We just opened it up today. Um, not a huge one like TD, but every dollar counts and the scholarship can pay for a couple of books. And so we are looking for students who share our values in that it's important to help others. So a really short essay on how you've helped someone else as well as what you've got planned for your future. Um, just to, to know what your, what your idea is. And it's open to students studying in Canada. Um, so don't have to be um, Canadian citizens and they need to be studying uh, in the 2021, 22 uh, school year. So check that out. Great, uh, yeah, international students especially are always looking for more award opportunities. So that's fantastic. Uh, another question, several more here. We got about six -ish minutes left. Um, okay. How do you draw up a budget to show folks uh, if you're dependent, you know, you're living with your parents, so your monthly expenses is basically just tuition? It's honestly, that is all it is, which I, I don't think it would be. So if we want to think about um, right now, most people are going to school from their computer in their home. So maybe at this particular moment, um, that's how it is. But if you are going to be going back in person on campus, what are you going to eat during the day? How are you getting there? Uh, it's usually not free to get there. So you need to think about all those little things. Um, even if you're going to have a gym membership and you're responsible for paying that, who's paying for your cell phone? Um, think about everything you could possibly do or touch or want. Um, and those are all the expenses you're going to need to consider. And um, sometimes it's hard to think about all those little ones because you kind of take it for granted. But if you know you're going to need to buy lunch every day when you're at school, um, that adds up pretty quickly. Uh, yeah, it sure does. Um, what is the best way to pay down debt before graduating without working part time? 
again, scholarships, grants, opportunities like that would be the best way, uh, as well as if you could um, convert somebody's loyalty points. So instead of asking for uh, something new for your birthday, ask somebody to cash in some of those loyalty points and, and use it to pay um, for existing debt, or you can actually use it if you still have more years to go to school against the next tuition payment uh, and be creative like that. Okay, very cool. Um, do you need your own credit card to apply for a line of credit? No, you do not have to have a credit card to apply for a line of credit. Those are separate, distinct credit um, transactions. And so they would approve each one separately. They'd be looking at it individually. Uh, I think it is very important to establish your credit history as soon as you can. And so um, if you're going to have a supplementary card from a family members, you want to um, be able to dig into that to see if um, you are going to be actually creating a credit history for yourself if you're on someone else's account. So you'd want to ask um, and dig into the fine print of whatever institution that is that's offering that credit card, because uh, it is important to start building up your credit history. So it might make more sense for you to actually get a card in your name with your parent to co-sign versus going as a supplementary on their account. But not, not required. One credit product doesn't require another to, to get approved. Cool. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, that's uh, helps clear things up. Um, how about when you're when you're working on your budget? Uh, what do you do if there's big parts that are uncertain? If you're hoping for scholarships but aren't sure if you've won any, uh, there could be a difference of thousands of dollars. So, so what do you do? Uh, so, I think you probably want to have um, one budget that covers every single thing. And then one that shows um, what if uh, um, I don't have that much money, what am I going to cut back? And to actually think through that, like how are you going to deal with it uh, and have a backup plan. So if you were counting on money from family as well as scholarships to pay for everything, would you then be prepared to work? Is that going to be your backup plan? And it's important to do that because you don't want to get partway through the school year and then realize you don't have enough money to get finished. Cool, cool. Just a few more minutes here, three or so minutes. Um, do you have any advice for folks who are living with disabilities uh, aside from, you know, OSAP or equivalent? Uh, I would highly recommend that um, if you're already enrolled for a particular school, you talk to their financial assistance department, as well as um, usually the Center for Students with Disabilities because they're aware of all of the different programs that are available. Uh, if you are still in high school, I would talk to your guidance counselor and um, ask them for resources that can help you uh, because there are a lot of other programs available. Um, I'm not an expert in those programs, but I do know that there are many available and there's certainly lots of accommodations and there are financial supports as well. So you wanna get to the right person. So if you already know where you're going to school, get to Financial Assistance Department and the Center for um, Adults with Disabilities in that particular school. If you're still in high school, get ask your guidance counselor for, for some direction. Okay, thanks. Um, are you aware of any funding for like living expenses as opposed to tuition and I guess residents specifically? Um, some entrance scholarships will come with um, residents included depending on, on the school and what they're offering. Um, a lot of scholarships, and I know Chris mentioned this earlier when he was talking about scholarships, oftentimes scholarships don't come with a, a restriction on the money going to the school. So you can use it for anything that you need it for. Um, case in point is the Young Money Scholarship. If you meet the criteria for eligibility and you're selected for a winner, you get the cash. It's, it, I'm not going to direct the money anywhere in particular, so you can use it whatever you need it for. Um, and, and so that, that's how a lot of those scholarships work. If it is an entrance one coming from a particular school, usually it's tied to tuition or, or residence, but any other ones that are not school specific can usually be more um, generic. And even a lot of the special awards in high school, those are just general. You can, can use them for whatever you need. Okay, great. Uh, we're just about out of time. Uh, a couple more we'll try to squeeze in, but if students uh, don't have you know, don't, can't get their questions answered right now. Uh, what, what's the best next step? Uh, so head over to the booth. I'm gonna stay there until six o'clock. So I'll be happy to answer questions. You can drop them in the main chat for 
um, the booth, or you can send me a private message as some people did earlier as well. There's um, contact information there. You can reach out later. And um, I'm sure for those who, who check out the podcast, check out some of the resources, some more questions might surface later. And uh, we're always doing new shows. So happy to um, create a specific episode uh, that addresses some questions people have. Okay, Tracy, thanks so much for your time and expertise here. Uh, yeah, I encourage everybody to visit the uh, visit financial, uh, financial Fitness booth to get some more answers and, and info. And Tracy, yeah, really, thanks again. Thank you. It's been uh, great and so many wonderful questions. Take care.